More than 50 people are dead in South Africa following torrential rains, flooding, and mudslides. Sudan's most famous protester, the woman in white, pushes for faster and wider ranging change. And how much gold is smuggled out of Africa? We'll have details. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Tonight we begin on South Africa's eastern coast where authorities say more than 50 people are dead after heavy rains caused massive flooding and mudslides. Officials say rescue workers spent Wednesday digging through the ruins of collapsed buildings looking for possible survivors. Hundreds of people are now displaced, mainly in the port city of Durban in KwaZulu-Natal province. Flooding has also killed at least three people in eastern Cape province, according to the South African Broadcasting Corporation. The region had been hit by heavy rains for days, but the authorities did not foresee the torrential downpour late on Monday, according to Lenox Mabasso, spokesman for the Provincial Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs Department. A KwaZulu-Natal Emergency Medical Services spokesperson says multiple dwellings collapsed during the mudslide. It's often said that women hold up half the sky. In half Africa, women also hold together households, communities and economies. When disaster strikes, including climate shocks, women have a special role to play. VOA's Karina Chaudhry and Amancio Miguel travel to the Mozambican town of Bira to see how women have been affected and how they're taking action after Cyclone Idai. On March 14, like all the people in this community in central Mozambique, Julia Tung did not sleep. Winds and heavy rains whipped the area. She is in her 90s, weak and partially blind. Like many others, Tung sought a refuge at a local high school. She still can't believe she managed to swim to higher ground, holding onto her grandchildren, bruised from her battle to survive. The women here know that when disaster devastates and destroys, they must rebuild and restore. In Ingingau, in the outskirts of Beira, Fatima Jesu Basopa cares for those in her community who are destitute and alone, including the elderly. They are having hard times. It's too much. They don't have children or grandchildren. It's such a pain. They don't get enough food, no shelter. It's a big mess. In this camp, Anna Pirish, who saw her house collapse, cooks for other displaced people. She dreams of better days ahead. It's so sad. I thank God. God will deliver. We will recover in the future. I foresee myself rebuilding. I will. God will give me the strength. Those seriously affected by the cyclone are in displacement camps, but some stayed behind. Since I have many kids, I found it hard to go there. 32 year old Aide João has nine children to feed, so it's back to business, selling smoked fish in a beira market. But she's not earning enough. These days, there is no money. The cyclone took all the money. People don't have enough to buy food. They don't get enough to eat. Aide João, Julia Tomo, Ana Pires and Julia Basopa are some of the many women fending for their families and communities after the storm. But they're not giving up. Too many people rely on them. Karina Chodori and Amais Miguel, VOA, Beira, Mozambique. Now you've had the expression, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Angola's Luanda province, home to the nation of the nation's capital, is surrounded by water. But many of its residents uh, still don't have access to clean water. As Elizabeth Casimaro reports, while Angolan authorities work to improve access to safe drinking water, delivery services are cashing in. Luanda province is surrounded on three sides by water the Bengo and Kwanzaa rivers and the Atlantic Ocean. But only half of its 8 million inhabitants have access to clean running water. 
Informal car washes like Armenian Shitembo have no choice but to use untreated sewage water to earn a living. We do this business because of hunger. We need to make ends meet. We are unemployed. That is why we are here. The United Nations Children's Agency says a lack of access to safe drinking water, sanitation and hygiene are the main causes of infectious diseases. UNICEF says nationwide, 44% of Angolans still do not have access to clean water. It means that people are in danger because not having access to safe water equals uh, the likelihood to get disease, increase morbidity and many times mortality. But the lack of clean water is also an opportunity for hundreds of drinking water delivery boys like Eliseo André Paulo. People need this water because in the neighborhood where we sell it, there is no water whatsoever. There are taps, but they have never had running water. The public water company of Luanda, Epao, admits there is a serious water shortage. We have an average production level of 540,000 cubic meters of water per day, while the need is over a million cubic meters of water per day. That is only for you to see the level of deficit and the need to implement these water production projects. Luanda's water company says financial issues have slowed progress, but projects in the works will eventually improve access to clean water. Meanwhile, Angolans do their best to get by using what dirty water they have or the clean water they can sell. Elizabeth Cosmero for VOA News, Luanda. Now, dangerously piled onto the roof of a train or packed inside, hundreds of protesters from the birthplace of the uprising, the toppled former Sudanese president Omar al-Bashir, rolled into Khartoum on Tuesday to support activists uh, demanding that the military council relinquish power to a civilian administration. About 4,000 protesters, many of them waving Sudan's green, red, black and white flag, greeted them at Khartoum's main station at the train, as the train arrived from Atbara. At Barra, located about 290 kilometers northeast of Khartoum, is a railway hub with a large rail worker population. It has historically been known to be the hotbed of opposition unions and unrest. Demonstrators began a uh, sit-in outside the Defense Ministry on April the 6th, five days before the military announced that it had ousted Bashir. The sit-in continues as protesters push for a swift handover to civilian rule. The number of demonstrators has swelled in recent days. A Sudanese woman who has come to symbolize uh, for many the protests uh, that forced out former President Omar al-Bashir says protesters want the whole regime to go away. And Bevan reports. This is Alar Salah. Known as the woman in white, she's come to symbolize for many the protests in Sudan that began in December and have led to the ousting of former President Omar al-Bashir. But Alar says her country's revolution is far from over. We want a better Sudan, a democratic state, one that judges all in accordance with the law without favoritism. So we're currently in the square until our demands are met. The first of which is the judgment of the previous regime, as well as everyone who spilled the blood of Sudan, including all of those who've committed crimes and corruption. Our revolution is ongoing until our demands are met. Alar rose to prominence after a video of her addressing protesters from a car roof at the beginning of April went viral. When I occupied that car, I was reciting a poem. The bullet doesn't kill, what kills is people's silence. It's by the great Sudanese poet Asari Muhammad Ali and describes the Sudanese reality. The reality of the revolution, the reality of the movement, the reality of the street, in a very accurate manner. It's an inspirational poem, describing the revolution, inspiring turnout. People are interacting with it because its words are a very accurate description of the Sudanese streets. Sudan's military removed Bashir a fortnight ago and formed a transitional military council to run the country for up to two years before elections. But protesters are calling for a swift handover to civilian rule. On Tuesday, demonstrators piled onto trains heading for the capital, Khartoum, to lend their support to the thousands of activists gathered outside the military's headquarters. Bashir and some other former senior officials have been jailed, and the military council has announced a series of anti-corruption measures. 
But these protesters are pushing for faster, deeper change. But that report was by Anna Bivan of Reuters. Now, nearly 90% of Egyptian voters have approved constitutional amendments that could extend President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi's rule until 2030. The judge Lashim Ibrahim Soliman, Lashim, uh, the head of Egypt's National Electoral Commission, on Tuesday announced the results of the country's three-day constitutional referendum. The number of those approving the constitutional amendments are over 23 million votes, representing 88.83%. The number of those disapproving the constitutional amendments are nearly 3 million votes, representing 11.17 percent. Well, shortly after the results were announced, Sisi used Twitter to thank his fellow citizens who dazzled the world with their awareness of the challenges facing Egypt. Supporters say secure leadership will make Egypt safer and help the country climb out of economic crisis. Opposition activists accused Sisi's government of pressuring people to vote in its favor. They also allege the government is influencing voters by giving them food and offering rides to the polls. The opposition says the constitutional changes would roll back the democratic dreams of 2011 when a popular uprising led to the ouster of former dictator Hosni Mubarak and that the referendum was marred by corruption and coercion. Sisi's government is denying all charges of suppression and rights violations. Now, billions of dollars worth of gold is being smuggled out of the African bush every year and funneled through the United Arab Emirates. A Reuters analysis shows how it surged and the severe security and health impacts of the wildcat mining it's fueling. Tim Cox and Matthew Lorotunda have this report. This gold is contraband, according to a trader we found in Uganda, the result of smuggling. A new Reuters analysis shows the scale of the black market trade in gold in Africa. It also shows where most of it's going. Dubai, where the gold is put into refineries and markets for destinations elsewhere. An exact estimate is impossible, but United Nations customs and trade data show that the UAE declared imports of $15 billion in gold from 46 African countries in 2016, for example. But of that 15 billion, roughly half, 7 billion, came from 25 African countries that listed no exports of gold at all to the Emirates. Trade economists and some of those countries say the discrepancy points to massive quantities of smuggling, and African states get none of the benefits from export taxes. God bless the hospital. Reuters' Tim Cox visited miners in one of those countries, Ghana. The Ghanaian government says that this unregulated artisanal mining has to stop. They say that it is wrecking the environment, polluting rivers, and poisoning farmland with toxic levels of mercury. To which the miners reply, well, that's all very well, but what else are you going to give us to do? There are no other jobs around here, and even the few that there are, don't pay anything like as well as gold. Mining, they say, has enabled us to feed our families, build our houses, and educate our children so that maybe one day they will have more options and will be in a position to do something better than this. Without mining, they say, they won't be able to do any of these things. It's a dilemma facing so many poor countries sitting on most of the gold that the rich world wants. And it's one that very few have any idea how to resolve. Most Western countries don't directly handle African gold because of these harms, as well as concerns about human rights and worries it may help fund conflicts. These problems are less of a concern in the United Arab Emirates, and the relationship is growing. Trade data shows that half of all the global imports of gold into the UAE in 2016 came from the African continent. That market share is almost double where it was just a decade earlier. This boy, age 12, says he has no idea what the foreigners do with any of the gold he mines. But that was Tim Cox and Matthew Larotunda from Reuters reporting.
I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Still ahead on Africa 54, China's Belt and Road Initiative in the spotlight. We'll be right back. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about, sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, and Hadiza Kiari, and Ayan Bior, and Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. I'm Vincent McCory, inviting you to the new look Africa 54, premiering soon. Same great team, but with new energy and a new host, Esther Gidui Ewart. Hi, and welcome. We'll bring you a closer look at politics, technology, health, and so much more, backed by VOA correspondents across Africa and the world, including perspectives from Washington, D.C., and Africans achieving abroad. Same time, same channels. Stay tuned. Well, Shireen uh, Mabunda Lioko is expected to be elected first female speaker of the Democratic Republic of Congo's parliament. Uh, to tell us more, reporter Anastasia today she joins me by phone from Kinshasa. Good evening, Anastasia. Hello. Yes. Now, when we started the show, the counting of the votes was still ongoing in the parliament. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Uh, do you uh, what details? What information do you have in terms of the counting of the votes? And uh, if it has been decided, but we know it is expected that uh, uh, this lady is going to win. How significant is that? Um, the name of the speaker is not, you know, it's not known officially yet, but it's a surprise. society. Everybody knows it is Janine Marunga, um, a, a, a politician close to um, the former president, uh, Joseph Kabila, who will be elected. Now, for many, you know, this is a history being made in that country. Uh, what made her become this... Um, likable in that time when, when the vote was going on when she came to the parliament everybody stood up and uh, it took time for people to calm down what makes her so popular i uh, uh, could not hear very clearly what she said but i heard some historic this, this moment is historic for the congo because this is the first time ever a woman will be a speaker and a politician um, of the um, party, coming from the party of the, of the former president, told me that it was historic because it was a woman, but it was also good for the Congolese people, because having a woman as, uh, being the second most important personality in the country, politically um, speaking, um, is a way to have a mother at the head of the country. And if a mother is dealing with the country's issues, it means that people will be satisfied with the decision she will make because she will make motherly decisions. Well, well, we'll follow up on this in the coming days. Anastasia, thank you very much for reporting. That's Anastasia today, she's reporting from Kinshasa. Now, in the wake of the public release of a redacted version of the Mueller report, some opposition Democrats, including a few running for U.S. president, are stepping up their calls for the impeachment of President Donald Trump. Overall, though, Democrats appear split over whether to pursue the lengthy and politically divisive, uh, divisive path of trying to impeach the president and removing from office. VOA national correspondent Jim Malone has more. Campaigning in the states of New Hampshire and Massachusetts, Senator and Democratic presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren is leading the charge for President Trump's impeachment. We cannot be an American that says it is okay 
for a president of the United States to try to block investigations into a foreign attack on our country or investigations into that president's own misbehavior. Fellow presidential contender and South Bend, Indiana mayor Pete Buttigieg is more non-committal. I think that Congress needs to make that decision. I think uh, he may well deserve it. Uh, but my focus, uh, since I'm not part of Congress, but I am part of 2020, is to give him a de decisive defeat at the ballot box. For the moment, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi opposes impeachment, preferring to hold the president and his administration accountable through congressional oversight hearings. Analyst Julie Pace. She feels like in order to move forward on impeachment, you have to not only have really solid evidence of an impeachable offense, but you also have to be able to bring uh, not just Democrats, but also Republicans on board. Many Democrats remain conflicted, says California Representative Adam Schiff. Is that the best thing for the country to take up an impeachment proceeding because to do uh, otherwise sends a message that this conduct is somehow compatible with office? Uh, or is it in the best interest of the country not to take up an impeachment that we know will not be successful in the Senate because the Republican leadership will not do its duty? Even Democrats who support impeachment concede that it is a lengthy and politically risky process, says analyst Matt Dalek. By the time impeachment proceedings were even to ramp up, you're talking about the end maybe of 2019 or early 2020, um, that, that creates its own complication because there's another remedy for removing a president, and it's called the election. President Trump blasted Democrats on Twitter and told reporters he's not even a little bit worried about impeachment. It's all part of the political battle to come, says expert John Fortier. Well, I don't think it's over. We'll keep talking about it. But I think the top line was, was what the president wanted to hear. It was that there was no collusion between the Trump campaign and Trump himself and the Russian government. Even if Democrats hold off on impeachment, the Mueller report is likely to get plenty of attention from Democratic presidential contenders all through the 2020 election cycle. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. China is welcoming representatives from 150 nations, including senior leaders of 40 countries, to discuss its international infrastructure program at the Second Belt and Road Forum in Beijing. President Xi Jinping met with Mozambican President Felipe Nussi on the eve of the summit to offer further humanitarian aid to help counter the effects of the recent string of disasters that have hit Mozambique. President Xi also met separately with Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and Christine Lagarde, the head of the International Monetary Fund. The Belt and Road Initiative is a key policy of Xi and envisions rebuilding the old Silk Road to connect China with Asia, Europe and beyond with massive in infrastructure spending. Analysts say it is not merely a conference on infrastructure building, but an attempt by China to display its popularity and power as a political rallying force. The forum is expected to see an emphasis on the importance of multilateralism and its criticism of protectionism in business and world affairs. Some observers see this as a veiled attempt by Beijing to build up world opinion against the United States. Now imagine stepping into a movie or a virtual world and being able to interact with what's there. That's now possible through the magic of Hollywood combined with virtual reality technology. For $20, the company Dreamscape takes visitors through a multi-sensory journey. Currently in Los Angeles, creators say they plan on opening more virtual reality venues across the U.S. and eventually to other countries. Viewers Elizabeth Lee shows us what to expect. Once visitors step through these doors, they leave behind reality and embark on a journey to another world. We see Dreamscape as a, a travel agency that will take you on adventures that transcend time, space and dimension. Imagine a trip to a zoo filled with alien creatures from outer space. Or going on a treasure hunt or an underwater adventure. I kind of forgot I was in Earth for a second and I was on the, actually under the ocean. 
Dreamscape makes it possible by combining Hollywood storytelling with the expertise of building theme parks. These ingredients are brought to life through virtual reality. Our technology allows us at, at Dreamscape to actually track your full body, all of your movements, and render you in an avatar. We use the word registration, where we're actually registering you as a human presence inside a virtual world is very unique. I think it's um, probably the future of entertainment in terms of a completely immersive experience. You kind of forget you're in a room. Before stepping into the virtual world, travelers would first have to put on four sensors, one on each hand and one on each foot, have a backpack on, and virtual reality goggles. Now they're ready to step inside. We blur that line between the physical and the, and the, and, and the virtual by letting you actually reach out and pet an alien creature or, you know, have a torch that actually lights your way and it's physically there. That's not all. Each person's backpack computer and the sensors in the room trigger special effects such as wind, mist, and ground vibrations. Welcome, team. I'll be leading you on an important mission. Six people at a time can take part in the 10-minute experience. The company is already planning new worlds for travelers to visit. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Los Angeles. Well, uh, here's what's trending. At a farm in Ogun State, southwestern Nigeria, suspended yams grow in a controlled greenhouse without using soil. The technology known as aeroponics helps deliver nutrient-packed mist that is sprayed into plant roots instead of having plant roots standing in soil or water, as with the hydroponics. The greenhouse is divided into sections, depending on the type of crop grown, and uses aeroponic tablets to supply nutrients sprayed on to uh, plant roots. Uh, to help reduce its dependence on soil, on oil rather, Africa's most populous country called for more participation in agriculture, which is currently, con uh, currently contributes about 40% of its gross economic output. Well, meanwhile, in an era in which concern over the world's climate only continues to grow deeper, experts are regularly encouraging extreme and perhaps even creative action. One such strategy that is growing more popular, yet is still unthinkable for many, is the consumption of insects. Advocates of edible insects stress the environmental benefits of sprinkling your dishes with crickets, grasshoppers and ants. Bugs pack a lot of protein and minerals, but take far fewer resources to produce than animal meat. Indeed, the market for edible insects is growing in North America, even as it's long established in many cultures throughout the world, including across the continent. And that's the show for today. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.